exist to see God glorified and disciples multiplied through the power of the gospel. And you were dead. Until we understand those words, the gospel will always seem like a little thing to us. Because in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, we learn that we were not simply sick or dying or mostly dead. We were dead dead. We were fully dead, meaning every part of our being has been radically corrupted by the fall. Meaning that we are totally depraved in our being. Meaning that we are totally unable to please God or to seek his face. Meaning that we are spiritually lifeless before God. No better than rotting corpses. Totally unable to save ourselves. The British philosopher Jeremy Bentham was an eccentric guy. He was the founder of the philosophy known as utilitarianism. And utilitarianism teaches that the ends justify the means. Or in other words, it does not matter how you got there as long as the end result was worth the pain that it took to get there. He's a brilliant guy. He changed the way that we thought as Westerners. But like most brilliant thinkers, he was a bit insane. He was a trust fund kid, and when he died, he had amassed a small fortune, and in his will, he left it to a local London hospital, but on one condition. In order for the hospital to receive the funds, Jeremy Bentham was to be present at every board meeting from then on out. So when he was died, he was mummified, dressed in normal 1800s business attire, given a a replica wax head over his skull, and then placed in a glass display case. And for 100 years, at every board meeting, Written down in the official minutes of the meeting, Jeremy Bentham was listed as present, but not voting. Present as not, but not voting. And that perfectly describes the human condition. We were all the original walking dead, biologically alive, but spiritually dead. And then in verse four, we read the two greatest words in all the Bible. But God. But God made us alive together with Christ. By the same power that that God used to raise Jesus from the dead, God raised our dead spirits, the spirit of every believer in Jesus. This is called the miracle of regeneration. I, I want you to say, when I say the miracle of, I want you to say regeneration. The miracle of regeneration. Regeneration is that miracle by which God makes the dead alive. Regeneration is how God changes us from the inside out. Regeneration is the way God opens the eyes of the spiritually blind. Regeneration is divine heart surgery, where God takes out the heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh. Another word for regeneration you may know is being born again. And so far in the book of Ephesians, we have learned that God worked the miracle of regeneration in our hearts while we were still dead. Not after it, not once we had believed, not once we had cleaned ourselves up and put on enough cologne to to cover the sit of our deadness while we were still dead. Regeneration occurred. And as glorious as the miracle of regeneration is, many of us are left with more questions than we can count. Why did God raise us from the dead? How did God raise us from the dead? And and what does it mean now to live as a resurrected believer? Well, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul goes on to answer every one of those questions and more. And if you have your Bibles, please please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. If you're using a pew Bible, Ephesians 2 is on page 1,159. And as you're turning, let me tell you, I know some of you who've been Christians here for 50 years and you don't yet have the answers to these questions. I know many of you have lived your entire Christian lives as passengers. It's like you've gotten into this car without knowing where you're going, how the car works, or why you got in. And like, sure, you're thankful for the ride. I'm glad you're thankful. I'm glad you're not getting out of the vehicle anytime soon. But let me tell you what, it is graduation day. You're about to know why you're in for the ride that you're in for. And my prayer this morning is that you would give God all the credit for your salvation. Not 98% of the credit, 
Not 99% of the credit, not 99.99999 repeating of the credit, 100% of the credit. Because in Ephesians 2, we're going to find that the Lord is the author of salvation from start to finish. And we're going to find three answers to the most fundamental questions we can ask about what it means to be saved. The first answer we'll find is in verse 7. Why did God raise us from the dead? To display his kindness. The answer will be to display his kindness. Next in verses 8 through 9. How did God raise us through the dead? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And finally in verse 10. What does a resurrected life look like now? And the answer is a life marked by good works. A tree that produces good fruit. These are some of the most pivotal verses in all of Holy Scripture. And and the way that you answer these questions will determine the the root of the rest of your Christian life. We're walking on holy ground this morning. It's one of the most blessed passages in all of Scripture. So let's pray, and then we'll tread carefully through these verses. Sovereign Lord, now indeed we find that thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. For the sake of your name, work miracles in this church today. As I preach, may the sermon that is heard be far better than the one that is delivered. It's by the power of the Spirit, in the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen. Look at me to verse seven of Ephesians chapter two. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Why does God resurrect the spiritually dead? Short answer, to show off, to display the glory of his kindness. Why did God save you and why did God save me? So that in the coming ages, we might be displayed as trophies of his grace. That in heaven, as all the saints are gathered around the throne in worship, every believer is like a little golden trophy, proudly displayed in a glass case, testifying to the greatness of the kindness of God Almighty. You can look around the throne and you say, God saved them, he redeemed them, he brought them to the end. And every one of them is a testimony to the greatness of the glory of God's kindness. You know, so often when the gospel is preached, it seems like God is all about you. Like that's his number one concern because he just loves you so much. He's just yearning for you. You're just so wonderful that you're to die for. Oh my goodness, who wouldn't love you? And God, he just did not want heaven without us. So he brought heaven down. And much of that is true. But if we dig just a little bit deeper, If we look for God's motivation for loving us and for saving us and for redeeming us, we find something surprising. Listen to the testimony of scripture. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That seems like the Lord, he cares about my, my needs. He wants me to sleep. He wants me to rest. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. It sounds like it's all about you, right? And then we get to verse three. And listen to the motivation for the Lord's affection for his sheep. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You know why God loves you? You know why he cares for you and provides for you? For the sake of his name and his glory. Because he is glorified when he takes care of those who are his. And it doesn't stop there. Isaiah 43, 7 says that God created us for his glory. Why did Jesus come? John 7, 18 says that Jesus came to seek the glory of him who sent him. Why did God choose us? Ephesians 1, 6, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. Don't get distracted by that word predestined. It just means to decide beforehand. We'll work that out later. But the point is that God does it for his glory. Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I don't know if y'all been out in the sea lately, but there's water everywhere. God does everything so that his glory would be known and proclaimed, and praised, and adored, and delighted into the ends of the earth. 
You know that God, he cares about, you know what he cares about more than anything else in the entire universe? The answer is his own glory. Doesn't God love us? Isn't that really selfish to care about your own glory above everything else? Absolutely, God loves us. But if God loved us more than he loved his own glory, then he would be an idolater. Because to love anything more than to love God would be idolatry. It's to worship that thing. And so for God to elevate us in a position above his own namesake and above his own glory is to be an idolater and to sin. And for God to sin is to cease to being God. You want a God who is all about his glory. You don't want a God who's about your glory because you're a terrible God. Your plans for the universe, they stink. Maybe good in the short term, terrible in the long term. God does everything for his glory. He loves his own glory more than anything else. And this is the answer to everything, to God's motivation for all things. God decrees or permits all things to come to pass because in the end, he receives glory from it. There's other reasons. There are other motivations, but this is the number one motivation above all motivations is that God does things for his name to be glorified. That in the end, the ends will justify the means because the glory will far outweigh the suffering experienced here on earth. Why is there evil in this world? Why is there suffering? Why is there sin and death and to decay? Because the sovereign Lord of the universe decreed that all things would work together for his glory. And so everything you see around us is working together for that ultimate end. If you pull back the veil, every disaster, every trial, every moment of utter chaos and disarray is a part of God's masterful and glorious plan. He's playing the long game. Our lives are like a vapor. We're here and we're gone. Of course you can't see the picture. Of course you can't understand what your pain is doing now. So you run into a movie theater and you watch 30 seconds of a two hour long movie and then you make a judgment upon the movie. You can't do that. You got to see the whole story. And in the here and now, our suffering seems meaningless, but it's not. It has a purpose. There is a design by it. You go to John chapter 9, the disciples account, encountered this man who's born blind. They say, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus says, neither, but the glory of God might be displayed in him. Do you ever think whatever affliction you're going through, that God decreed it, allowed it, caused it even, so that he would be glorified in it? How many years did that man live his life as a blind man, having to beg, unable to work, unable to be integrated into that society, but God used it all along for his glory. There is purpose behind your pain. And the glory that will one day be revealed is not worth comparing to the suffering we are facing now. The world we're living in is more glorious somehow even though I cannot explain how. The, the world we are living in now is more glorious because God decreed that sin and death may be. He allowed it to occur because somehow in the end, the ends would justify the means and, and there would be a more glorious outcome. How do I know? Because God is in control. He is good. And the judge of all the earth, he will do right. Amen? So now we return to the question of Ephesians 2. Why does God raise sinners from the dead? To display his kindness in raising them from the dead as trophies of his grace. And now, of course, some people may say, if God is good and he has the ability to raise people from the dead, then what's kind about him raising them from the dead? Because what did it cost him? If he's all powerful, it didn't cost him an ounce of energy. If God is good, then isn't he in some way morally obligated to raise people from the dead? Like imagine your grandma dies. We go to the funeral. I have the power to raise her from the dead, but instead I just pat you on the back and say, tough loss, man. It's cruel, isn't it? How then is God kind in raising sinners from the dead? Well, let's try to think like Paul is thinking here in Ephesians 2. What is more glorious to heal a dying man or to raise a dead man? What's more glorious, to show kindness to Judas or to Peter? What's harder, to show love to a stranger or an enemy? 
And now we see the juxtaposition of verses 1 to 3 compared to verse 7. That God has showed kindness to those who have hated him. Who were his enemies. Those who were by nature children of wrath. And I think the point here is that God is able to display the riches of his kindness in resurrecting our dead souls because we were totally undeserving of that kindness. Amen? And now the question is how? How did God do it? How has he accomplished this miracle of regeneration in our dead hearts? Verses 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. Not by cooperating with man. Not by evaluating a man's works and determining who are worthy of resurrection. Not a result of work, but by grace through faith so that God gets all the glory. There is only one who can boast in any person's salvation. And he reigns on high. You know what my Bible says? The Bible says, there is none good, no, not one. No one does good. No one seeks for God. Do we believe that? Do we take that seriously? That the first inclination in your heart to seek after God may have been a work of the Spirit, drawing you to God. It may have been idolatry in your heart, searching for something in God that he did not have. Maybe you search for money or compensation or power or comfort or community. And you know, maybe I'll go to church and I'll find community. Maybe, you know, they, they keep saying God is, is what's missing in my heart. Maybe I just need that to live a complete life. That's not searching for God. That's idolatry parading as religiosity. When we look at those who were dead in sin, it's, it's not talking about the Mormons or the Muslims or the atheists. It's talking about the Baptists. Talking about those who were born in sin, children of Adam. And that's why no one in the kingdom can walk with pride because none are deserving of grace. Otherwise, it would not be grace. It would be what you are due. That's why if you go to Romans 4, you don't need to go there now. But if you look to Romans 4, Paul looks to the Old Testament figure of Abraham. That Abraham believes God right and God counts Abraham. You're righteous. You may be lying that your sister's not really your sister that she's your wife and there's shady stuff going on with Abraham. He doesn't deserve forgiveness, but God looks at Abraham and says, you are righteous through faith. And so Paul says, you do not become righteous by working, but by believing. You know, I got many good friends who, who are Catholic and they, they tell me, look, salvation is by works because faith is a good work you have to do. Faith is meritorious. It's by believing that you earn right standing before God. That's the first step, Taylor. But if you look to Romans 4, and if you look to Ephesians 2, faith is different from working. God says, you were counted as righteous by faith, not by works, which is why as Protestants, we have taken the language of you are saved through faith alone. That's why we can say that. Because faith, according to God, is not a work. Instead, faith takes on an entirely different category. We'll get to that in a second. To believe is not to work. To believe is simply to receive. Faith is simply the instrument through which we receive the grace of God. Faith is the car and the vehicle by which you are traveling to your final destination and you are being carried along. And there is a participation in that. But you're not driving the car. You are not powering the car. You are not directing the car. Faith is simply the vehicle and the instrument by which we receive the grace of God. I'm reminded of a song by a rapper named Hazakim. It's called No Not One, based off Romans chapter 3. He, he writes this. He says, kiss your cross, count your beads while praying in monasteries. Repeat a thousand our fathers, recite 10 million Hail Marys. But these things are not necessary on the day when we're buried because there's none good, no, not one. You may mention the name of Jesus as you take an award, have a great credit score, and even give to the poor. Even if you participated in the race for the cure, we're in danger. Our sinful nature greatly angers the Lord. Hold candlelight vigils in memory of a victim. Donate your clothes and feed the homeless volunteer in the soup kitchens. A law-abiding citizen with a respected position, but still none good. No, not one. 
There, there's no way for you to, to, to tip the scales your way. If good is over here and bad is over here, you are all bad. The Bible says that, that nothing can be pleasing in the sight of God apart from faith. So that's why even when, when billionaires get on the TV and they, they give billions of dollars away to charities, it is not a righteous act before the eyes of God because it's not done glorifying God. It's not done in faith. We need to be given salvation. We need the gift of grace because it's only by grace through faith that any are saved. And there's something unclear of this verses. When Paul wrote, this is not of your own doing, look to verse eight. What was he referring to for the this? When he says, this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. What is the it? What is the that? Is grace the gift of God? Is salvation the gift of God? Is faith the gift of God? Of course, we'd happily, amen. Grace is the gift of God. Of course, we'd say salvation is the gift of God. But we hesitate when it comes to that last one, do we not? When it comes to faith, is it the gift of God? If you look at verse 8, the most natural reading is to say that faith is the gift of God. Faith is the thing that is not your own doing because you were dead and dead men simply do not believe. Can we talk about free will for a moment? Sure. As well, we're, we're kicking the nest. Let's start with something, something simple. Let me ask you, does God have free will? I'm going to answer, absolutely. But it's also true, the Bible says that God cannot lie or change his mind. Indeed, Hebrews says that clearly. Do those in heaven have free will? Absolutely. But can those in heaven sin? Absolutely not. Can those who are Christians on earth, do they have free will? Absolutely. But it's also true that Christians cannot obtain perfection here on earth, nor can we lose our salvation. And now we return to, to sinners. The question is not, are sinners free? The question is, are sinners responsible for their choices? The question is not, do sinners make free choices? The question is, what is the nature of a sinner? Will a sinner ever desire to do good according to the scripture? Will a sinner ever seek for God or believe in the gospel? And the Bible's answer is no. In and of ourself, a sinner by nature is a child of wrath, bent against God and all that he is. Ephesians 2, 3, we will never choose Jesus never decide to follow Jesus, never seek for God, left to our own free will, according to our own nature and desires. As verse three says, we happily choose disobedience and destruction and God is just to punish us for our choices. The words of Charles Spurgeon, free will has led many a man to hell, but not a single one to heaven. This is why we need the doctrine of election. This is why we need the doctrine of predestination. This is why Paul has been building his case since chapter one. This is why we need the doctrine of regeneration because unless God moves, we never will. Let me share another quotation. This is a long one. This time by an artist named Shailen. He says this, don't let the thinking of modern men fool you. God does what he wants. That's what it means to be sovereign ruler. It's deep, but not complicated. With complete confidence, I'll state it. Listen, this is how God has always operated. His amazing plan made his hand save the man Abraham from a pagan land. Who can argue with the people that God chooses? Israel and not Egypt, Peter and not Judas. Humanly speaking, it should have been Saul and not David. The inheritance should have been Esau's and not Jacob. The truth, it speaks brightly so that you can see rightly a huge mighty God who chooses the least likely. We are the clay and we've been formed by the potter. None can come to the son unless they've been drawn by the father. Because of original sin and all of our despicable deadness within, election must be unconditional then. Some people say that we're drowning in the ocean, barely floating until God threw us the rope then. Our free will helped us as we groped. Our faith is the hand that grabbed the rope and God pulled us back in the boat. Nope. Without apology, I deny that analogy. Reality, we were dead at the bottom of the sea. I was a swollen corpse with hope no more until Jehovah the Lord drove from the shore to the ocean floor. Yeah, I was a corpse and I smelt like it. I'll keep it simple. Why did God choose me? Because he felt like it. 
He brought me out, not an act of my volition, breathed life into my lungs and didn't ask for my permission. Throughout the Bibles, there's major examples of this, pages of passages like the raising of Lazarus. Rather than debating the master's gift, we should be happily praising his magnanimous saving of savages. Why does he choose some and not others to see Jesus? Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. And now we return to the question at hand in Ephesians chapter two. Is God more glorious if faith is a gift? And I think Paul's answer is absolutely he is. In love, God gloriously, kindly grants faith to sinners. He draws sinners to Jesus. And when he does so, Jesus is so irresistibly glorious and good in their eyes that through faith alone, they may receive through grace alone salvation from all of their sin, to be saved from the power of the devil, to save them from this world, to save them from their own wicked nature, to save them from the wrath of God. And that salvation is available to all who will humble themselves before God and rely totally upon his grace and his grace alone. We see this offer clear in the Bible. Whosoever will come. And when you come, thank him for drawing you. And that's where we could say amen and go home and close our Bibles. But Paul answers one more question. If we have indeed been resurrected from spiritual death, what does it now look like to walk with spiritual life? Is the Christian life now based on our own abilities and efforts? Now that we've been saved by the Spirit, do we need to work this out in our own abilities and strengths? And this is the real question underneath all of this. Does God stop receiving glory once we believe? We're in the kingdom. He's done the work. Now it's up to us. Look to verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To be God's workmanship, it needs to be his new creation. Literally, we are God's handiwork, that he has done the work in us. He has made us new. He has made us for a purpose, and that purpose is to walk in good works. Good works are not the fruit of salvation. They are the root of salvation. They're the natural result, not the reason for our salvation. But be sure, Christian, those who have true faith, those who have received the grace of salvation, they will walk in good works. Sometimes they stumble. They don't walk perfectly. It's a progress. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. But they will walk. How do I know? Because God himself says In verse 10, that he has prepared every good work we ever perform, that we should do them. Why is he performing the good works? Can he leave some of it up to us? And I think the answer to that is so that he gets the glory for every good thing that we ever do. Christian, everything good in you is only because of the work of the Spirit manifesting itself in your life. And God gets the glory from that. Every evil thing you ever do, you're responsible for and you get the credit for that. I said it last week in the words of Jonathan Edwards, the only thing you contribute to your salvation is the sin that made it necessary. We are still called to work indeed. That is clear. Philippians 2, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. There's fear and trembling. It's a process. You are called to work. But the end of that verse says, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work to give you the desire to do good and to, do you, to give you the ability to do good. That is a sentence that only God can write. How does that make sense? Honestly, I have no idea. These, these, these truths are difficult. These are heavy concepts. And I'm not, I'm not trying to answer every question. I am trying to go incredibly deep with the sermon. But, but I will say, I want to leave a lot of this up to mystery and just say, I see all these truths clearly laid out in the scripture that he chooses, he is sovereign, he is in control, he gets all the glory that we are responsible, we make free choices, and God is righteous to punish us. How do those things work together? I don't know. That's above my pay grade. But that's a sentence only God can write, and he writes it many a time in Holy Scripture. Good trees will produce good fruit, and bad trees will produce bad fruit, and that is a guarantee. Say this. Remember, my prayer this morning is that you would give God 
all the credit for your salvation. Not 98% of the credit, not 99%, not 99.9, 100% of the credit. Because in Ephesians 2, we found that the Lord is the author of salvation from start to finish. And we found three answers to the most fundamental questions of salvation. Why did God raise us from the dead? To display his kindness in saving us. How did God raise us from the dead? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, revealed in Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. And in verse 10, what does a resurrected life now look like? A life marked by good works, which God has prepared beforehand. So let me ask you, are you ferociously passionate about praising God for his kindness? Or are you attempting to steal some of that glory for yourself? No, I believed. I was the one that walked the aisle. I prayed the prayer. I was there that night. That was my choice. Yeah, of course it was your choice. But who gets the glory? God. Do not be a glory hog. He deserves it all. Are you tempted to believe that you're really not that bad? Are you tempted to believe that you could have saved yourself or that you did save yourself? Or maybe you don't even believe that you needed saving at all. Who is on the throne of your heart? Is it you or is it God? You know why we struggle to believe that God is sovereign? Because in our own flesh, when we walked as dead men walking on this earth, everything revolved around us and we got all the credit for everything we did. And it is devastating to human pride to read the things that I have read today. Will you render to God the glory that is properly due his name? That is the question given to every one of us this morning. This morning, I've got five, maybe six, depending on time, pastoral charges for us. First, pray desperately. Pray desperately. The doctrine of the sovereignty of God underlines that nothing in this world can be accomplished apart from prayer. Nothing can be done without the power and the moving of God. This should lead us to be people that are desperately dependent on prayer. Lord, would you save their souls? Would you move in your heart? Would you change their hearts? Not relying on our own efforts to save people. But every time we share the gospel, every time the word is preached, every time we open our Bible, say, Lord, I can't understand this without your grace and without your spirit opening my eyes. Help me. Help me. Pray desperately. Second pastoral charge, do not trust in works. Do not trust in your works. If you don't believe what Romans 3 and Ephesians 2 are clearly saying, then you will stand before God one day trusting in yourself. And that is a desperate place to be. If you were to die and you stood before him, he asked you, why should I let you into my kingdom? What is your answer? Because your answer, there is only one true answer. There is only true way. is to stand before the Lord and say, I have no other argument. I have no other plea. But that Christ died and that he died for me. Can you stand before God and say, I don't deserve to be here, but by the grace of God, I am here. Do not trust in your works. Trust in Christ alone. And let me just say, if you're just thinking I want to beat you down and take away all pride and destroy you, I do want to do that. No one in the kingdom should walk with an air of pride or confidence. Nobody in the kingdom should walk with swagger. But in the kingdom, nobody walks with a limp either. Because by grace, you've been raised to the heavenly places. By grace, you are a new creation. You are God's workmanship. And so it's not just on, on judgment day, you're like, oh Lord, I just, I just hope that you might forgive me. It's Lord, by the, by the power of Christ who has made me new, let me in. I'm coming. Let the, let the gates be opened up because though I deserve hell, Christ has purchased heaven and I'm coming in to see the face of my Savior. That's our plea. And if that's not your plea right now, turn from your sin, put your faith alone in Jesus and give him all the glory, which leads me to my third pastoral charge. Give God every ounce of glory at all possible. Will we get to heaven and ever say, oh Lord, I ascribe too much to you. Oh Lord, I gave you too much credit. It's impossible, even in this sermon, where I've tried to as explicitly and clearly as possible, given the Lord every ounce of credit, I've still fallen fall short of being able to do so. Give him all the glory. Fourth pastoral charge. Put your faith alone in Jesus. 
More than 500 years ago, the world was revolutionized by the idea that faith in a Savior could save you. That it is not by the sacraments of a church, that those who hold the keys to the church do not hold the keys to heaven and hell, but by the grace of Christ alone, anyone who goes to the scripture can discover what the Bible says. The reason you have Bibles in English, the reason you have Bibles in your pews at all is because the world was changed 500 years ago at the Protestant Reformation. And it's all founded on this idea of sola scriptura, by scripture alone, sola fide, by faith alone, sola gratia, by grace alone. Not by our works, but God gets all the glory. Fifth pastoral charge, walk in good works. Remember all the way back in verse four, he says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. The purpose of your election, the purpose of God's predestination, the purpose of his sovereignty is so that you would be more like Christ and be conformed to the image of God. So use all of your energy, everything that God grants you to become more and more like Jesus. And I think that's all I have left to say. So let's pray. Jesus, you are so gracious towards us. We do not deserve it. But by your blood, you've ransomed us as a people for your own possession. You have lifted us up and made us your bride so that we may be present at the marriage supper of the Lamb at the end of time. May our hope and trust be put in nothing less than your blood and righteousness. And may we glorify you as we continue to worship you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hi, Taylor Callen, pastor of Oregon Baptist Church. Thank you so much for listening to this sermon. I pray that you are more encouraged and love Jesus and the gospel more after hearing the sermon than when you first sat down to listen to it. Know that that our heart at this church is that this sermon would be an encouragement to you and would be a useful resource, but would in no way replace the pastor that God has called to shepherd you or the church that you're called to be a member of. With that being said, If you want more information about our church or want to hear more sermons, go to horicanbaptist.com.